through those doors. We have to enter his courts with praise. That's all this is. It's just reminding us every single time we come in here that we have to rejoice. For, for, for if only the fact that we made it to see another week. Because some people didn't make it. Even this week we heard, we heard news that um, our dear sister Erin Gilbride's father passed this past week. Uh, she used to attend here, but she now attends at House of Praise in Manchester. Um, and her father passed, you know. So it's not, tomorrow is not promised to you people. Promise, tomorrow is not promised to any of us. So we have to take advantage of it when we get it. Amen. So I'm going to get into the Word of God. Um, and it's funny because Pastor Ruth sang a song about um, going back, take me back. Take me back to where I first received him. And there's something about that feeling that we have when we first receive God in our life. You are just so excited and so just energetic and, ex and just want to just run, 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 and do, do, do. And God reminded me of something. He said, to ask you this question. Have you ever seen somebody or looked at somebody and you looked at them and you said, that person is just so childish? Raise your hands if you see. I know I have. I know. Okay. Raise your hand if you're the person people usually say are childish. No, no, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest. <laughs> you, that, he's like, yeah, that's me, that's me. <laughs> At some point, we were all childish. But I'm here to tell you today that being childish is not necessarily a bad thing. Well, at least being childlike. Being childlike is, is, is interesting because when you think about children, you think about some of the characteristics of children, right? Some of the things that I think about with children, I'm not talking about kids, I'm talking about toddlers. Toddlers, they are excitable. They're trustworthy. They believe anything you tell them. You, some might even say they're gullible. But they do it with the best intention. They're loyal, exuberant, and they're extremely energetic. They have boundless energy. They will run around, run around, run around all day long if you let them. Um, and I, I, I find that kids have some special innate quality in them where they just are so pure until they get tainted, you know, as they get older. And it feels like the older and older we get, the more tainted and tainted we, <laughs> we become. But there's something about that childlike quality. I've even heard athletes talking about they got to a certain place in their career, and after a while, they just didn't feel the same anymore. They didn't have that love, or they didn't have that joy of the sport anymore. And some of them didn't even want to play anymore. But then they said they were revitalized when they realized that I got to go back to why I started doing this in the first place. And a lot of them will say, I have to go back to that, that joy I had when I was a kid. And it's that joy that they had when they were a kid that reminds them of the thing that they loved. And it allows them to go back to being that person once again. And God was showing me the same thing is in the house of God. Many of us, when we were a child or when we first got saved, we were like that child. Or we were childlike. We believed every single thing that the Word of God said. If it said it in the Word of God, uh, it's true. It didn't matter what the circumstance you were facing at home. All you did is look in the Bible to find what the Word said about it. And if you found it, you stood on it. You didn't care what it was. As long as the Word said you can do it, as long as the Word said you can have it, as long as the Word said that He will provide it, you believed it without question. But somewhere along the way, we lost that childlike faith. And God is just telling us that it's time for us to go back to that. 
And he's challenging us to return to our childlike ways. And I'm, I'm not telling us to, to be, to go, this is not about youth or anything, because you could be as old as Methuselah, for any of you that know, that's the oldest person in the Bible, you could be as old as Methuselah and still be childish. I know some grown adults that are as childish as can be. So it's not about age, it's about your mindset. It's about your heart. It's about how you feel about the things of God. Because when you're a child, you look at things from a different perspective. Do this exercise with me, if you will. Close your eyes. And I want you to think, I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to think as you would when you were a child, okay? And think about how it makes you feel. The first one, fireworks in July. The second one, Playing in the rain in the summertime. The third one, the, the bell for the start of recess. You hear people starting to, to start to smile, and you hear them start to laugh. The end of day school bell. Every, <laughs> Another one, the sound of the ice cream truck coming down your street. Yeah. Amen? Can I get an Amen. My point is, when I ask you to block out everything, not think about the bills, not think about the job, not think about the relationships, but just close your mind off for a second and go back to your childlike days. And you began to reflect on these things. And all of a sudden, you began to smile. And some of you began to laugh. And you began to realize how joyous those little things were in your life at that time. But somewhere along the way, we lost that childlike faith. And I want to just show you something. This is not just me coming up with this. This is Bible-based. So turn with me to Matthew, the 18th chapter, the first through the fifth verse. And it says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus. Who came to Jesus? At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, and they asked. Now, again, let's set the stage. These are the disciples of Christ. These are hand-picked individuals that Christ himself has called to go and walk with him and to do this work. Many of them at this point have already done great things on their own and are well-known amongst the people. So this isn't just some Joe Schmo off the street. These are God's chosen individuals that are coming to him to ask him a question. And the question that he asked them is, he said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, first of all, you know that they were all men, because the men always want to compare and say, who's best? So they're coming to Christ and they're asking him, Christ, you know, I'm your favorite, right? You know when you're kids and you go to your dad and you're with your sister or something, you say, Mom, Dad, who's your favorite? And they look at you and say, you're all my favorite. But really, they know who the favorite is. <laughs> but at this time, they come to Christ and they're saying, God, Jesus, who is the best? Who's the greatest in all of the kingdom? Who is the greatest? And this is what he said to them. First of all, none of y'all. He said... He called a little child to him and placed a child among them. And he said to them, truly I tell you. Now, first of all, truly I tell you means this is, what I re this is the truth. I, this is exactly what is true, and I'm going to tell you that right now so that there will be no misunderstandings, no misconceptions. This is the truth. And the truth of the matter is, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now again, I remind you, these are the disciples of Christ that are there. And he told all of them, unless you change. So that meant that whatever you were doing was not good enough to qualify you to get into the kingdom of heaven. He said, you have to become as a small child if you want to enter. 
Now, I don't know about you, but when I was reminded of the scripture and I read this, I was like, whoa, wow. That is a serious proclamation that we may not even make it into, the, into heaven if we don't learn to be like these children. And then he goes on to say, therefore, whoever takes the lowliest position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name becomes, uh, welcomes me. So in bottom line, is God, Jesus said, listen, you have to scratch all these things that you've learned about what is important. And you have to put aside all these things that you've been focused on. And I need you to realize that you have to become more like a child once again. Now let's examine that and ask yourselves, why would he ask them to become like a child? Why would he do that? Well, one of the reasons because children can become excited over anything. Absolutely anything. I remember when my kids were little, we would take them to a park. They had these things they call wood parks. And as soon as we drove up to one of these wood parks, my kids would behave as though they were at Disney World. They would jump out of the car. Sometimes it was still moving. They're jumping out windows. They're just running to this park like this is amazing, the best thing that they've ever seen. And all it had was a slide, a merry-go-round. It might have had some jungle gym, but it was just covered in wood. And But for some reason to them, this was the most amazing thing they've ever seen in their life. But when they went there, they were so excited and so happy, and they would spend absolute hours there. And why? Because kids have a secret gift that is the ability to learn to love things for exactly what they are. Do you know what, how powerful that is? To love things for what they are? If you take that principle and you apply it to your sister that's sitting to the left of you, and your sister that's sitting to the right of you, and despite what they may have done in the past, or despite what they may have said last week about your dress, or what they may have said about your hair, or what they may have said about how jacked up your nails were, if you could still just love them, I know it's hard, but love them for who they are. It's a gift. It is a gift. And the thing about it is, when you show a child that slide, they look at that thing and they start thinking of all the potential that that slide has. They say, all right, I'm going to run up there and I'm going to slide down it. Then that's not good enough. And then they say, I think I could run down that slide. So they run, go up 15 feet into the air and they run down the slide. And then that's not good enough. They say, you know what? How about if two or three or four of us go down the slide all together? Don't act like you didn't do that. Then they say, no, nah, that's not good enough. I think I could run up the slide. And then they run up the slide. All these things, they see all the potential in this one little slide. But let me ask you this, adults. What do you think when you see a 15-foot steel slide? <laughs> the first thing we say is that thing is dangerous. <laughs> the second thing we say is if I got short some, I'm going to get a rug burn all the way down that slide. And we know we all been there. But the difference is when you're a kid and you go down that slide and you get all scuffed up, you come up and you're laughing and you're like, let's go again. When you're an adult, and you get hurt, you're like, I'm never doing that again in my life. <laughs> Who was the crazy person that stopped putting up a 15-foot slide made out of metal was a good idea. But when you're an adult, you say, I got hurt. I'm never doing that again. And many of us have done that in our lives. When we get hurt from something, we say, I'm never going to be, go back there. I'm never going to expose myself to that again. I'm never going to allow that thing into my life again. But that thing could be something great for us. 
But because we got hurt just one time, because the wrong person said something one time, because you didn't achieve one goal, we give up on the whole thing. And God said, we have to have that childlike faith that says in spite of what may have happened, the, 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 the potential of what could happen is even greater still. And so at that point, we have to understand that our, the expectations that we put on things can be dangerous as adults. Because as I said, children don't allow preconceived notions to get in the way of their happiness. How many of you told, the, I could tell my kids, you guys better not go down that slope. Like, when we would do anything dangerous, my wife would tell my kids, you better not do that, or you're going to get hurt. Me, I'm like, that looks pretty fun. But you know what happens? The kids look at that thing, and in spite of what we think might happen, they say, I still think it's worth trying. And they go and they give it a try. And so what I mean is that kids are still able to look beyond the hurts, to look beyond what it might be, and what, all the danger, all those things, and with a pure and innocent heart say, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to give it a try. And especially if somebody that they know and trust tells them that they can do it. If I told my kids that they could do something, it didn't matter what it was, they were going to give it a try. They were going to try it. Because why? They believed in what I said. Let me take you to a scripture. Matthew, the 19th chapter, the 13th through the 15th verse. And once again, then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. And then Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them from the kingdom of heaven. Uh, uh, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. But once again, you see the children coming to Christ. They're going to their Heavenly Father, and they're going to him to be blessed. And the disciples, once again, the older ones, try to say, no, 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 this is not the protocol. You can't come here now. This is not, where, this is not the right place in the pl right time. But Christ stopped them and said, listen, these are what the kingdom of heaven is all about. These children, these childlike individuals is what truly makes up my kingdom. So again, he reminds them that he ha they have to have the childlike um, faith in heart. The, so what are the essentials of childlike faith? What does it truly mean? At the heart of childlike faith lies a genuine and innocent trust. As children believe without a doubt that they can look up to the parents with the unreserved faith relying on their guidance, protection, and most of all, their wallet. And in the same way, we are called to approach our Heavenly Father with that same unwavering trust and faith that he is going to provide for us and whatever we need. When my children were small, once again, I was teaching them how to swim. And so after that, I taught them how to swim. I wanted them to feel confident in being around water. So I told them, all right, go line up there, and I'm going to get in the water, and I want you to run and jump into the water. Now, again, my wife was like, please don't drown my children. And I said, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. And my children would run without even thinking about it and jump in the water, expecting me to catch them when they fall into the water. And so they would run in, and they would jump, and I would do my very best to grab them. Now, I'm not perfect. I may have dropped them once or twice. I'm not going to say I didn't, but I'm not Jesus, and Jesus will never drop us, and when Jesus says jump, we jump. Now, when my kids jumped into, the, into my arms, I tried to grab them, but sometimes they would go underwater a little bit, and I'd have to grab them back into my arms, and they would come up, and they'd be coughing, and they'd have water up their nose, and they'd be, like, choking, and I'd have to just let them, let them get it all out, but they were still safe. 
I didn't allow them to drown. And so it, it still had, they still had trust in me. But when Christ does that, we may go through things. We may still get, have to go through a little bit of turbulence. We may still suffer a little bit. But the point is that no matter what happens, he will not let you drown. It is inevitable that every single one of us in this building will go through trials and tribulations. I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care about your title. I don't care how fragile you are. I don't care what type of good person you are. I don't care if you're black. I don't care if you're white. I don't care if you're female or male. It does not matter. If the bishop can't escape a trial that would knock most people on their butts, then why do you think you're going to be exempt? No, no, it don't work like that. But what does happen is he guarantees you that through your trials, that if you have that childlike faith where you could say to yourself that I don't care what happens or what comes my way, I am going to trust in my father because he has never let me down before, so he will not let me down now. That is the essence of childlike faith. Childlike faith is amazing and it's wonderful. And the other thing that children have is they have an ability to trust in God's word. In Isaiah, the 54th chapter, in the 13th voice, verse, it says, I mean, 13th verse, it says, All your children will be taught by the Lord, and great will be their peace. See, when children are small, they are so accepting of things that they're told. They are so accepting of things that they, and they are willing to receive knowledge. And they are hungry for knowledge. When kids are small, man, they want to know everything. Have you ever been on a long drive with a child? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Why is the sky, why is the sky blue? Why is the, why, why is the water blue? Why is the ground, why, why they paint that red? Why is the colors of the red, those flowers like that? Why is that bee humming? Why is it going up? Why is it going down? Why are we going here? When we, are we there yet? They want to know everything that they can see. They want to answer. They are so hungry for the truth. They are so hungry for knowledge. They are so hungry for the word. When we were children in Christ, when we were babes, we could not wait to get to Bible study. I wonder what I'm going to learn today. I wonder what he's going to say about the Word of God today. I bet it's going to be something that's going to help me through this week. Oh my gosh, we had such a great Bible study last week. I know this one's going to be even better. Their minds are so hungry for the Word. But then, we forget that childlikeness. And now, all of a sudden, oh, it's a long day. I can't make it. I'm tired. Oh, man. Um, my car only has half a tank of gas. It's like It only takes you a quarter of a tank of gas to get to church and back. We come up with all kinds of reasons why we don't need to or don't have to or shouldn't do these things. But again, our childlike selves is looking at us just shaking their head like, Mm -mm -mm. What happened to you? What happened to you? That hunger and that thirst for righteousness that used to be your driving force and your motivating force and your guiding light to your life is no longer there. It's been replaced by fears. It's been replaced by fatigue. It's been replaced by aching joints. I don't, I, I've been there. Trust me, I've been there. That's a real thing. We need to pray and bind that spirit. Man, when I get up in the morning, just putting my, my shoes on is a task. When you have to grunt to tie your show, shoes, you know there's a problem. And I'm not alone in here. I'm not alone. There's more. But the thing is that what I mean is that children just want the hunger. They want knowledge and information. 
But as we get older, we don't want to ask for that information. We don't ask anymore. Because we think we know everything. We do. We think we've read through the Bible once before, and we got everything we need to know, so we don't need to do it anymore. But don't you know that the Word of God is a living, breathing Word? I promise you, if you're going through something and you need an answer, you can go and read a scripture that you might have run a hundred times. But in that day, in that situation, in that circumstance, all of a sudden, it takes on a whole new meaning in your life. No, you can't stop reading. You can't stop chasing after his word. It will save you. The truth of God's word is everything. And we cannot allow ourselves to not be willing to ask God the questions to what we need in our lives. You know what we come like? We come like men driving somewhere that they don't know, and they don't know the directions, but they don't want to admit to their wife that they don't know the directions. I know I've been there. And she'll tell me, oh, do you sure this way? Yeah, 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 I know where I'm going. And then after a while, you get so far off course that you have to put on that blinker to turn around. And man, that's the hardest thing to do as a man. And you turn around, <laughs> and you start going nowhere, the other direction. And if you have a good wife, they won't say, I told you so. <laughs> but even if they don't say, I know they're thinking it. And they kind of look at you, and you don't look. You just keep your eyes on the road. <laughs> but now we got GPS, but we don't have to worry about those sort of things. So we just keep going. But honestly, the truth is, GPS is really nothing more than a pre-recording of ours of how to get to the place. And we just put it on the computer and follow it so that our wife won't keep saying, do you know where you're going? <laughs> no. All right, so once again, we have to be willing to ask the question. The last thing that we have to do as children is I want to read this scripture to you. It's Matthew, the 18th chapter, the 6th through the 10th verse, and it says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. I'm going to just stop right there. I just need you to understand that when you look to your left and when you look to your right, those that you are looking at are the children of God. And if you are to cause that person on your left and that person on your right to stumble, let me read it again. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. That means to put a huge weight on their neck and throw them in the ocean. This is how serious he is about what happens when you cause one of his own to, be, to stumble. And it even goes on further to say, woe to the world because of, this, of the things that cause people to stumble, such things must come. But woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. If it, it is better for you to enter life ma uh, maimed and crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye than to have two good eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Understand this. It is so important that we continue to have that mindset, that we look to our left and to our right and understand the importance that we need each other. We have been preaching this whole entire year about being one about being a community, about being a family, about needing and being there when someone is in need. And this goes to further emphasize the fact that 
when we trust and believe in one, if I trust in you and you do something to hurt me, that goes a long way, right? That can break that trust. You could bring me down. You could cause me to not want to come back to this family, to this home, to this community again. So our, 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 our mandate by Christ is that don't cause my children to stumble. Because if you cause my children to stumble, I will come down on you with the wrath that you have never known. Have never known. And I think it's important that we read this so that we understand this the next time we get angry with one another. And before we say even a word, we need to remember what the Bible said. Because it will change the way we treat each other. It will change the way that we treat one another. You'll think twice if you remember what the Bible said. That a stone be hung on your neck and you be thrown into the deepest pits of the sea. I don't know about you, but I can't swim that good. And I don't want to be the first example. I don't want to be the example. So become childlike in all that you do. And return back to your first love. Return to that first love and return back to that youthful exuberance that you once had that made you want to give all that you have. You remember when you were a kid, you would give anything to anybody. You didn't even have to know them. And if they, they asked you for it, they're like, can I have a lick of your lollipop? Here. Can I have, a, can I have some of your ice cream? Here. Now... As adults, can I have a look at No. You better go buy your own. No, you got germs. I get so mad at my kids when I ask them for a lick or something or a sip or something, and one of my kids especially, she'd be like, no, you can't drink from that. Or if they give me a sip of their drink or use their straw, they're like, you can have it. I'm like, girl, I raised you. I will lick everything in this house. You know, we just say crazy stuff. I will lick everything in his house. But we raised them. We taught them. We brought them. And yet now, as a child, as adults, we don't want to give anymore. But children give everything freely. How do you do it, give? Do you give your tithes freely? Do you give your offering freely? Do you give it without somebody having to prompt, pump you up and prod you and make you shout and what, march around the church seven times and all this stuff? Freely God gives to us, so freely we should give back to him. And not only that, that's just the base. That's the base model. You know, like when you get a car, you get the base model, and that's just, that's just the basic stuff. But then you've got to get the extras. When you look out amongst you, and you see your brother and sister in need, and you have a couple extra bucks, do you freely give? When you see that they have been wearing the same things all the time and people are ridiculing them, do you go out and buy them a dress? Or do you invite them out shopping with you and buy them something? Do you freely give? It is imperative that we understand that all of these things matter. And they make us whole as an individual. You think that it's about the person to the left and right, but it's really all about you. If you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you have to be as one of these. Childlike. In your giving, in your thinking, in your devotion, in every single area in your life. I will read this, this little bit before I go on. It says, let us all strive for a childlike faith. Let us approach our faith, faith journey with open hearts, humbly acknowledging our need for God's guidance, joyfully marveling at his creation, forgiving as we have been forgiven, trusting fearlessly in his power, and maintaining a persistent curiosity for growing spiritually. And may our life be a reflection of childlike faith that draws us closer to the heart of the Heavenly Father, 
And may it allow us to, to use the experience to, to be richened by his holiness. And as we continue to walk in the faith, let us remember the words of Jesus. Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. So today, I'm encouraging each and every one of us to, as pa Bishop Ruth said in the beginning, take me back. Take me back to my first love when I first received. Because back then, we did have a childlike faith.